All right. So without further ado, I'm going to bring up Mr. Todd Carnes. You guys give uh, Todd a big warm welcome. Will you put that on your lapel while I introduce you? So Todd, guys, he is um, a broker for Todd Realty Partners. Uh, that's where we hang our agent license. Uh, he is a very, very knowledgeable fellow. I, can't, I cannot go through all of his uh, background. He's been CEO or CFO of a bunch of different businesses. He started businesses, run them, sold them. Uh, some of them are still going with different managers and owners, but he is a businessman in this business, all right? So he looks at it from top down. He looks at the macro data. He sees, I know he's looking at this industry in this hot market right now uh, with eyes wide open. So I asked him to come give us his take on it. So I'll let you give your background, and you can get that little um, thing going. Is this a mic, or is this just going to be it's close? Recording. Okay. All good. right. Yeah. All right. So Todd Carnes, thank you. Thank you, my friend. Yes, sir. Oh, awesome. Yeah. All right. So listen, there was this. Uh, there was this family, this uh, mom and dad, and they had all the kids out of the house. Last one out's a boy. Right, he's still living in the basement. Can't get him out. Trying to figure out what he's going to do, so they're trying to nudge him out, and what he's not going anywhere. So they're like, "Well, let's get a plan. We, we at least need to figure out what this boy's future looks like, so we can get him the heck out of here." So this is what we're going to do. We're going to lay out one night. We're going to hide over here in the side closet. We're going to have him come in. He always comes in late. We're going to put a table right there, and we're going to put a pint of Jack Daniels right here. So we'll put a thousand dollars cash right here. We're going to put a Bible right here, and we're going to let him walk in late and see what he does. If he just takes the liquor, then we know he's going to be here in 20 years just being a party head, and we got to adjust, right? If he takes the money, then he's probably going to be a successful businessman. He'll find his rhythm and get rolling. He takes the Bible, and then he's going to be a man of the cloth. He'll be a preacher, and we can rejoice in that. So they set it all up. He comes dragging in about 2 a.m., and they're hiding off to the side. It's this guy and his wife. And he rolls up, and he kind of looks at it. He's a little confused. He doesn't know what to do. So he grabs the, the pint of Jack Daniels, takes two big old swigs, sticks it in his back pocket, pulls the money out, kind of fluffs it up, makes sure it's real, sticks it in his pocket, takes the Bible, puts it under his arm, heads off to his room. The dad and the mom are looking at this, and the dad's kind of peeking around. She's behind him. She's going, what's he doing? What's he doing? What's he doing? And he goes, oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> and she's hoping for the best. He's thinking the worst. He goes, what did he take? And he explained that he took two swigs, put the money in his pocket, and put the Bible under his arm and left. And she goes, what does that mean? He goes, he's going to be a politician. <laughs> <laughs> so I can, uh, I can say that joke because I'm elected to town council, and if you're offended, you just had to get over it. But <laughs> I... Uh, as Andrew said, I, I kind of came through this through a, a different path. Uh, I'm a little schizophrenic in the things I've done vocationally, and, and I'll talk to you about that a little later. And some of that is just, you know, a, a desire for a new challenge. I, uh, my lovely wife Carrie is right here, and I saw my partner here somewhere. He might have stepped out, but we uh, we graduated University of Alabama, and then we lived overseas. I did three years in Russia doing non-governmental uh, aid work and missionary work, and and planted a church and served in churches for a bunch of years, planted Radius, which some of you guys, guys may know. And then uh, recently, me and Todd Lyle started Todd Realty Partners, and uh, that company is about two years old. I, I led a medical company for a while and started there and was there for about five years. And yeah, I like, I like a new challenge. So, so I'm not the dude that's in front of you who's been doing this 20 years and knows everything. Uh, I am the guy who has some fresh eyes on things because I've run organizations and, and like to learn new things. So I'm a little fresh, but I'm also an engineer by trade, so I, I'm good at the numbers. Uh, some, I stink at other things. My, my wife's got all the intuition, right? So uh, I can bring her in and, and she can just feel things that I wouldn't see if you told me. But uh, I, get, I get the numbers. She gets that. And so Andrew asked me to talk just a little bit about some market stuff. And then I want to try to give you something that'll take you maybe from market stuff to some career stuff, uh, because that's maybe a little bit more my sweet spot. Uh, but, but we will talk a little bit about 
about the market stuff. And so, uh, as you know, if we take a look at uh, the Columbia market, that's pretty much what we're looking at right now, right? That thing is on fire. And so for some of us, that's fun. Some of us, that's frustrating. I mean, how do you get something lit up like that? I'll tell you how. It's a real easy formula. Print $6 trillion and just hand it out. <laughs> That'll put everything on fire. Yeah, that's right. Let me do the math for you. $6 trillion, that's $17,000 for every man, woman, boy, and girl in the United States of America. I got a family of five. If they would have just handed that money out, it'd be $85,000 to me. Mm. I think I got like $1,500. I don't know who got my other, eighty-three five, <laughs> But they're spending it and it's on fire, right? And so, so we have this thing going on right now where it, it really is unprecedented and we're all sick and tired of hearing that word unprecedented. I am too. Everything's unprecedented, right? Unprecedented pandemic, unprecedented pol political divides, unprecedented lack of goods and services and supply chain mess ups and, and housing, unavailable affordable housing. <clears throat> but it really is unprecedented. I wasn't in this game in 08. I was planting radius in 08. And so I was uh, a little insulated from, from what was happening. Not insulated, I just wasn't that in tune with what was happening in the market. But we had a guy come and present to us at Lexington Chamber uh, a couple months ago, and he was bringing MLS stats. And when you look at inventories today versus inventories in 2007, before it crashed, were 50% of what they were back then. I mean, it's twice as bad as it was back then, which is really kind of, you think about it, it's, it's a little hard to believe, and it kind of makes me think that maybe another fire is coming. <laughs> My wife and I lived in Russia in the mid-90s, and we were doing our work over there, and we were there when hyperinflation hit Russia. This is a little size free before you right here. We were there when it hit, and they started printing rubles and handing them out, and it got so bad that this bottle of water used to cost 10 rubles. Now it cost a million and a half, no lie. Is that kind of inflation. I think it was 1,400% in one year. And so what happens when that happens? Oh, you just cut, you cut six zeros off of the money and reprint it just to save face and start over again, which is, which is what they did. It was 10 years of pain they got out of it. I don't think that's coming, but it could. So let's talk about a, let's talk about a fire market, uh, give you some stats, record-breaking stats year over year. And I don't know we got any people in the retail game? I got some Lexington folks over here that are in the retail game. Anybody in the retail game or all y'all? We got a few. All right, so I won't go down the retail thing. Uh, most of you guys are investors, but median sales price up 19%. And all this comes from, from MLS. It's current. Average days on the market now 40%, uh, which seems actually seems like it's higher. Average amount of inventory is what I was talking about, down 60% year over year. And, and significantly worse than it was in 07. And here's a, uh, here's a fun little fact, 4,873 agents, 900 listings, one listing for every five agents. And so it, it's, it feels a little crowded <laughs> if you're in the retail side of things. Uh, you gotta drive for listings and drive for dollars and, and do whatever you can to make that work. So, so that's where we're living. Uh, if you're gonna make it in this industry, pretty much any industry, I mean, there's a lot of places where you can go and, and not have to learn to pivot, not have to learn to adjust, not be a continual learner. Uh, I mean, there, and there's all kinds of occupations like that. I grew up in Gadsden, Alabama. My brother works at a, at a Honda factory there. And his job is steady and it's, uh, you know, there's not a lot of variance. He don't have to pivot and he likes it that way. He's built that way. You want to survive in this thing? You got to learn how to pivot and you got you to handle some risk. And so based on the risk and, and some of the craziness that's going on out there, I was going to give you guys a, a few ideas about some strategy shifts. And, and a lot of this is uh, maybe pointed at people that do some retail, but it, it, it applies all the way around. Farming your own network. Uh, I was talking with a guy today. I did a closing today, and he's been in this game since 07. He started his agency in 07. How do you like that? <laughs> that was, that's bad timing. So uh, whatever that guy says, I'm doing the opposite. But he's a great guy. And he, he actually, he survived it, which was even more impressive. And you know what he told me? He said, I survived because we started in 07. And we realized if we can't make the phone ring, it's not going to ring. And so from, from the day one, we figured out how to make our phone ring. You know what that guy's doing? He's well established in Lexington. He kills it. They're knocking on doors right now. He goes, we've never knocked on doors in our life. We're, we are 
going in neighborhood and literally knocking on doors trying to get listings. And he obviously got one. I bought it from him today. And so there's all kinds of tools. And Andrew's a guru at all these, all these programs. I had no idea he's running all that. He's a guru at all the software and artificial intelligence, and there's a lot there. None of it is as great as your own network. My partner, Todd Lyle, uh, that's, his, that's his number one thing. I've only always farmed my network. And ultimately, we're growing. We're a small two-year-old brokerage. Uh, we got seven agents. Uh, but to grow out of that, you know, you got to get out of your network, but you're going to build your base out of your network. So <clears throat> really successful people, they're great at that. They get outside of it. Number two, nurture your previous clients. Like in the wholesale market and in other markets, uh, don't forget about those guys. That's your greatest source. I'm, I'm buying a deal from a guy, and we're doing a development. And I was at his house the other day, and the negotiation went really well. You know, and you can make those things run off the tracks. This one went really well. And I was just at his house, and, and we want to buy some property with some mobile homes to do some rentals. And we, uh, we, we can't find them. And I was sitting there, and he goes, Hey, when we get done with this, I'm going to call you in a few months because he's got some land with some mobile homes. I'll probably get a chance to buy that off market. And that's from nurturing a previous client, just building a good relationship with him. And so find ways to do that. I mean, on the retail side of things, I'll tell you, everybody I do business with in 2021 will get a handwritten card from me at the end of the year. Uh, I'm, I, I wish I was better at marketing and I would send them even something that was clever and cute outside of that. I'm just not my strong suit, but I'm going to write them a card. They're going to hear from me and they're going to know it's personal. And I'm nurturing those folks because I got to have them in 2022. Experiment with new messaging and mediums. Mediums. Uh, that's a, a, a broad statement, but I don't know. I live in Lexington. Our brokers is in Lexington. Uh, Andrew's team kind of works a lot of Columbia. We've got some Lexington folks here. 80% of all billboards in Lexington right now have to be real estate focused, at least. And that may be, that may be underselling it, right? And so you guys are familiar with all the messaging and medium, mediums. I keep wanting to say a medium. <laughs> That's in a road. Mediums and uh, and Andrew, I didn't realize that they got the mail service. Like, you need to experiment. We've done multiple different things. Uh, it's hard to figure out what your ROI is, but don't stay in the same cycle. Experiment around. And it's kind of funny. I don't know what's happening. I don't know if it's through the Midlands, but people I talk to in, in Lexington, where I primarily work, is people are just getting bombarded with text messages, video messages by text mailers, emails, asking to buy their house. We want to buy your house. I've got ready-made buyers. And, and it's like broad and mass. And, and I'm not sending those. I kind of wish I was. It's a great strategy. And so all of this mass mailing efforts are producing benefits. And if you don't have the bandwidth to pull that off, I don't have the bandwidth to pull that off. That's all right. Just circle back and use your bandwidth to personalize some of that because a personal touch will get you some touches. And so you can text message your network and you can say, and, and by the way, with the lenders that are right here and with the wholesalers that are here, you can message that, hey, we're looking to buy a house in your neighborhood. I want to buy your house. And if you can get it under contract, you can either work with these folks to, to flip it. You can uh, sell it to a wholesaler and make a profit and move forward. I put this one in the wrong order. We'll come back to that one and diversify your income streams. And you guys are, are doing a lot of different things. I tried to write down some, some income streams that I was thinking through and y'all could probably add, I'll get y'all to add to it. I mean, obviously there's wholesaling, there's retail, there's flips, there's coaching fees. How about this one? Referral fees. You ever just sit around and brainstorm? Like how can I, maybe I can't get all these listings in this tight market, but how can I, make some referrals to other agents and pick up a 25% referral fee if you're an agent or if you're a, uh, a wholesaler. Um, I'm not sure you guys should be aware the hedge funds are super active in our area right now. They're making lots of offers sight unseen. And so there's a, an easy quick turn with, uh, with hedge funds right now, seeking out rental income, looking at 
development. Uh, if you if you think through trends, there are some trends out there that you know school districts have always ruled. Everybody wants to be in X school district, and you can look at the property values and see what's happening there. Well, guess what? Like COVID turned that thing upside down a lot. A lot of people are used to remote school. We have lots of virtual options. I actually sit on a charter school board for the state of South Carolina, and there's going to be lots of virtual options. And a lot of people are just shuffling the deck and moving to public charter schools, which you can drive to. And so what's that going to do? It's going to elevate values in other districts and maybe diminish in some of the premieres. I don't, I don't know that I can see the diminishing in the premieres, but I can certainly see the uplifting in other districts. And so when you're talking to clients or when you're driving for dollars or when you're doing these things, maybe you look in other areas and go, as this shift happens over the next three or five years, oh, this neighborhood's coming back big time and these things are going to appreciate significantly. And so keep that in your, uh, in your tool belt. The other interesting thing I wanted to share with you guys is some things that are happening in the market. I sent this out to our agents uh, just recently about <clears throat> some of the creative things that, that people are doing trying to get the buy. I mean, has anybody who's been in a really competitive buy situation recently, has anybody been in one of those where you know you're competing? Like, I was talking to an agent recently, and they had 50 offers. I was like, 15? He said, no, 50. I made him say it three times, and he's from here. We speak that same kind of Southern draw. <laughs> I was like, I, was, I just knew he was kidding. I was like, I don't even want that listing. Who wants to put 50? I mean, how do you manage 50 offers? Uh, we had one that had 15, and it made me feel like I did a poor job. Uh, so it's that kind of scenario, and people are, are going through that. So people that are creative are finding creative ways to bid on those. And so I was talking to our agents. I actually, I sent them an email, <clears throat> a few things. I've seen people turn in offers, and the earnest money is just a gift. Just keep that outside of closing. Here's five thousand. This might this this is not really an earnest payment. This is a gift. You take my contract, and then I'll still pay you this full contract price, non-refundable. Just trying to, and that's trying to win like a hundred ninety thousand dollar house. You know, it's not a, a million dollar deal. It's that competitive. Don't we all wish we had like four or five of those and be on the other side of that? So, I've seen that very recently. I've seen somebody else turned in an offer on one of our listings, and this way they said, we'll beat the highest offer by $2,500 up to $210,000. I think we were listed at 185 because you're just trying to pull a number out of air when you're in that competitive environment. And so, you know, everybody's like, well, what I bid on them? I'm going, well, let's find what's reasonable and add 15% to it because, I mean, there are no deals. And I saw that and I thought, well, that's kind of ingenious. Like, if you really want the house, just really put it down, and then that way you can bid low. I recently did that just on Sunday. I did that on a house that was up for 75000 and I would have paid eighty for it, but then I came back and just said, I'll pay you sixty because it had $50,000 worth of termite damage. They, they should have talked to your guy, Andrew. <laughs> they missed that one. I've never seen that much termite damage, and it was kind of quantified. But, but that way, I just told him, I'll pay. I'll beat, any, I'll beat your highest offer by a grand in $1,000 increments. And that way, I started at 60. But my offer was good to 80. Obviously, somebody was good to 81. So I, I missed. Or, uh, or they didn't appreciate that. But also, like in our, in our industry, what I'm doing is, is you kind of have to call agents beforehand and go, hey, I just need to know the rules of the game. Before we start playing the game, will you explain the rules? Are you going to honor escalation clauses or not? Because it's kind of new, at least in our scenario. And some people are like, I'm going to honor them. Some people will not. A lot of them don't understand. I've found, I've found <clears throat> a lot of agents don't understand that. Clause. And, that, and that's because it's so new that, you know, it's, it's kind of, a, at least in our area, it's a very new kid on the block. And so... Certainly get there early and just, you know, in a polite way, just tell me the rules because I'm going to compete and, and I want to know how to compete best. And so it is, you know, I felt uh, when I was able to 
instead of offering 75, offer all the way back to 60 and say, you know, I'll go up another 20. Like, I like that on my side, and I really don't mind it on the, uh, on the sales side if somebody wants to do that. Uh, doesn't bother me because they're, they're probably going to be up there at the maximum anyway. And so there's some new, there's some new things that are happening out there. You guys would, would obviously be aware of, of other things, but more important than ever right now is just understanding your appraisal values uh, because appraisals are, are just lagging and it's hard for them to catch up. My wife, who's over here, she just turned a deal and they did, desk, did a desk appraisal and they did it based on listing prices, not closed prices, which tells you just how busy the lenders are. <laughs> like, I mean, I don't know how you miss that. I don't know who the lender is and I wouldn't tell you anyway because that's really a black eye. But, but you know, people are just that busy and it's kind of when mistakes can happen. And let me give you this other one. <clears throat> Continuously build your relational capital. That's where I'll sit down for a minute. I have, like I said, I've, I've done multiple things. I, I'm not the, the real estate guru. Uh, I, I'm old enough now to say this too, like uh, I'm, I'm 52. So there's like, there's decades in life and then there's stages in life. And so like, if you're in your 20s, and I get to mentor, I saw Zach back here, he's mentoring some folks. I get to mentor some folks. I love that part of life. Like if you're in your 20s, you gotta get every skill you can. Master every skill that you can. I mean, can you learn how to frame? Can you learn finance? Can you learn <clears throat> real estate? I mean, what skills can you put in there? And then in your 30s, you can take that and you can build your network and you can learn leadership. And if you get skills in your 20s and you learn leadership and build a network in your 30s, then in your 40s, you get to create. And you see a lot of people make career changes in their 40s. I did twice. <laughs> My poor wife. But you take, you take, if you've got a network and some leadership and a little bit of capital and some skills, then you can create in your 40s. That's probably what a lot of you guys are doing. You're thinking about how do I create? And it's not always linear like that because I'm jumping into real estate, but my partner's been doing it 20 years, smart enough to, to go in with partnership, but, but I've learned network and I've learned some skills. And so in your 40s, you get this opportunity to create, or in your 50s, I'm 52. And then in your 50s, if all that works out, you get to generate wealth. Because if you've created something and you got these things, you know, you can generate wealth. And it, even if, you know, like, if you feel like, uh, like I'm late to the game, everybody feels like they're late to the game. But in a decade, oh, you can really move the needle. And so, I mean, Andrew, how long have you been in the game? When did you leave? So, so Andrew, like he's created all this stuff. He's been full-time focused on this thing three years. And it's about, it's about partnership. And then if you're able to generate wealth in your 50s, then in your 60s, you get to think about legacy. And they say that people, people assume that people in their 60s aren't that happy, but studies show that they're some of the happiest people in the world. Now, it's painful. <laughs> Everything I got hurts right now. I'm rehabbing all the time, right? And I'm not even there yet. But in your 60s, the burden of the future is released. If you're in your 30s, you got three kids. If you're in your 40s and, and you got all kinds of stuff to pay for, there's a burden of the future that weighs on you. But then if you, if you learn your leadership and you create and you build wealth in your 60s, then you get to think about legacy. And legacy, at the end of the day, I mean, it's what really matters. A lot of people don't have margin to think about it because it's go, 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 go. And I imagine that's why you're here because you want to get in a position to think about your legacy a little bit. I know I do. So let me give you... Four quick things. Let's, let's move from real estate real quick. Let me give you four quick things for success. Uh, there, this guy named Patrick Lencioni wrote a book, The Ideal Team Player. He's written a million books, made a gazillion dollars. He's really good at consolidating things. This is his material. I added a little bit to it. But he's got a paradigm. And if you're going to be successful as I was a, a COO uh, at a big company, uh, pastor to church, I 
lived overseas, did multiple things. If you're going to be successful in any of those realms, you better be a good team player. If people don't want you on their team, you're just not going very far. There are a few guys that are cavalier and go alone, ladies that can make it just out of sheer ability. And then they kind of conquer everything and everybody comes in their wake. But, you know, they're, they're one in a gazillion. The vast majority of us, as we alluded to earlier, you got to do it in a team. And so Lencioni says this statement, and he's exactly right, that the people you want on your team, they have three characteristics. They're humble, they're hungry, and they're smart. And if you evaluate people, you evaluate people you want to do business with, you evaluate people to put on your team, we evaluate people to put in our brokerage, humble, hungry, and smart. Everybody leans one way or the other. Nobody's perfect all across uh, the spectrum. And so as I go through them, you, you'll figure out maybe where you're at. But if you will, in addition to learning these things that we talked about earlier, in addition to learning to pivot and strategies, like this is core. You figure this out, you're going to enjoy your 60s. If you miss this one, you may generate a ton of wealth in your 50s. 60s may be hard when you start thinking about legacy for us all. Humble, hungry, smart. Humble seems like self-evident. Uh, it kind of is, but we think of humble as soft. We think of humble as passive. Actually, humble is, I, I like to think of it as strength under control. There's people that are really strong that can hold their strength and they don't have to play their card every time. They don't always have to be the smartest lady in the room. They're humble, but it doesn't mean that they're weak. And we can feel that and smell that a mile away. And so to function on any team or in any partnership, you got to have some level of humility. And let's face it, in this industry and in most industries, you know, there's, there's a lot of people that are really successful that probably couldn't spell that word. And that happens. But, but you can win in the short term without humility. You can be arrogant. And you can win, you can have charisma, and you can knock it out of the park. But it's a hollow victory. If you're going to be on a team, because it's not fun to win by yourself. It's only fun if you're winning on a team. Win together, lose together. you got to be humble. I've seen, uh, and you guys probably have too, you've seen bulldozers, uh, guys or ladies that, that just by sheer strength of their mental fortitude and the way they carry themselves, they can just bulldoze through any room, any place, and get it done, right? I've seen those people. I know some of those people. And, like, I, I appreciate the fact that they get it done. But it's, it's short-term wins. As you get older, you realize, like, those are short-term wins. And some people are satisfied with short-term wins. But it doesn't translate to long-term wins. Because the collateral damage you leave in your wake, it just keeps you from landing in that kind of partnership where you want to land. When I was leading Radius, uh, there was a guy that we brought on staff from Fort Mill. <laughs> and as he was, uh, he served with us for a while. And as I was transitioning and moving back into the business world and going to Southern Med, uh, I was talking to him one day and he gave me the best compliment ever. Because I'm not, I'm not the most humble person in the world. I, I have a saying, you're either arrogant or fighting arrogance at all times, right? And if you don't know which one, you're probably arrogant. So, you know, there's always this, there's always this internal battle, right, of trying to have appropriate humility, uh, but, it, but it certainly doesn't stifle confidence or drive. And the, the best compliment I got out of this guy said, listen, there's like 10 of us uh, around the staff table. And he said, man, we would handle like hard subjects. And I was always wanting you to jump in and, and dictate it. I wanted you to jump in and make a call. And it seemed like you were passively sitting back. Like, why did you do that? I was like, oh, because I believe on the other nine. Like all these other nine people here, like I recruited them and they're strong and they've got passion and they got drive. And if I get out in front of them and, and make some kind of declaration, like eight of them are going to be gone in six months from now. I have to give them space. And humility is that ability to celebrate other people's victories. And you'll meet a few people like that in life. Let's face it. I mean, human nature, there's not a lot of those kinds. But the discipline of learning to celebrate other people's victories and wanting them to win, 
I'm real competitive. You guys are competitive. You wouldn't be here on a Tuesday night. But in that competition, if you can't celebrate the victories of others, then you're going to be jealous of those victories. You're going to have disdain and you're going to always be in this competition that's not even going to let you celebrate yours. But humility is that ability to, as, as is written in the Bible, rejoice with those who rejoice. And it's, it's not an easy task. But in the realm of partnership, it'll make everybody want you on their team. You got to be humble. Don't be a bulldozer. It, uh, it won't work out very well. Number two, you got to be hungry. That one's kind of self-evident too. I, when, uh, <clears throat> when I went to Southern Med, we were like 45 employees. I left, we were about 120. Uh, managing 120 people that are primarily W-2 hourly folks, great people, but whew, there's, there's a reason those guys uh, that, that do that well are highly, highly valued. It's a very difficult thing. And so when I, when I thought about a new business, I wanted to be in a business where it was just self-motivated folks. And so that's who you guys are. That's who I am. You got to be hungry. You got to be self-motivated. Uh, I wrote down, you, you got to be driven towards success, but not afraid of failure, uh, which is not an easy thing to do. The, the fear of failure is big for all of us in, in every realm. I would say if you, if you really have a fear of failure, you need to go find something to fail at. You'll figure out it's not fatal. Just if you get through life, if you go all the way through life and you didn't fail at anything, you attempted way under your capacity. If you failed at a few things, then that means you, you swung at some things that were above your capacity. And so the things that you accomplished were probably at your capacity. But it's easy to play it safe. But don't play it safe. It, uh, looking back, it won't work out well. To be in this business and any other, I wrote down, hunger is about being a lifelong learner. Like I get stimulated by learning new things. If I'm in something five or six years and I feel like I, if I go into management mode, then I'm trending down mentally, emotionally, in every way because I feel like I'm going backwards, probably because I am. Because I'm not looking for something to manage. I, I'm looking for something to create, something to grow. And to do that, you got to learn new things. And you got to go from, from being the guy that sits at the head of the table to the guy that sits of the chair outside of the table and you start all over and learn. So you got to be a lifelong learner to be a, a good team player. And I wrote this down to be hungry and a lifelong learner. Like make yourself a bucket list. Think about the things you want to accomplish. I went back and looked at my bucket list and this is kind of funny. Uh, one of the things on there was flip a house. Uh, you said you did it for 18 years. You probably can't count them. My partners did like 300 I think I've done six, but four or five years ago when I was writing my bucket list, I was like, I want to flip a house. I know how to flip a house now, it's, uh, and it's fun. I, I grew up with a dad who was in construction. Another one was start a company. I led some companies, but, but I wanted to start a company, and that's probably a five-year-old bucket list item. I got another one on here, skydive. I ain't got the courage to do that one yet. <laughs> it's kind of like <laughs> I'm going to have to hustle if I get there, but, uh, but I'm planning on doing it, planning on knock it out. But the power of writing things down, don't ever diminish that. I know that, that these guys teach that a lot and it's write down what you're going to get done this week. But to stay hungry, you got to write it down and it will pull you towards it. Last thing you got to do is you got to be smart. Uh, when I was at Radius, we, we used the, the deal. We called it uh, character, capacity, and chemistry. It's what we were looking for when we were trying to hire folks. Uh, and, the, and the smart deal is kind of chemistry. He's talking about, he's not talking about book smart or intellectual. He's talking about the smart side of relationships, soft skills. Can you read a room? When you talk, are you credible? Are you believable? Can you negotiate? Can you empower people? Can you are you demeaning when you talk to them because you're smarter than them? Or can you humble yourself and lift them up and get the best out of them? Those soft skills, which are almost never taught, uh, which is crazy, uh, 
they are the things that that separate great leaders from task oriented people. I did a I did an engineering degree because I grew up in a small town in Alabama. My dad used to drop me off in uh, the, the far corners of a of our town outside of Gadsden with a shovel, a pick, and usually a coke, and go, son, I'll bring you something back at lunchtime. And then he would. We, we had batter boards up where we would put a room addition. Usually it's like a 1,000, 1,100 square foot house. He had some FHA stuff and he would, he would lay out the, uh, the room addition. And then I had to dig the foundation. And it was, it was just an all day job. It's just, just how we did it back then. I'm sure, you know, everybody does that with mechanical stuff now. Uh, but, but he would put me out there and that, that put hunger inside of me. It, it also put like a, a work ethic inside of me and it made me go learn skills when I was 19, 20, 21. But even if you learn those skills, the people who are really successful are not the people who just learn the skills. Like that's just one. The uber successful people are the people who learn the soft skills on top of it. I mean, I could still be an engineer down somewhere in Jacksonville, Florida, having been there for 35 years and still doing the same thing I was doing 35 years ago, be really good at it probably, but no expansive room for explosive growth, no bucket list that looks like this, no relational network that, that spans all over the place. Like it would have been, it would have been lucrative, but it would have been boring. Right. And so you have to take some risk to get out of the boredom of life. And, and everybody's got their limits. Uh, I've got my mental capacity limits, you've got yours. I've got my sales limits, you've got yours. But remember that you just wanna be the very best version of who you can be. Don't play the game of comparing yourself with all the other people around you, because everybody loses. Everybody loses in that one. I've done it about 20 years, I can tell you. It's a lose-lose strategy. And so just to, uh, to close up and, uh, and encourage y'all, humble, hungry, smart. Evaluate yourself. And it doesn't matter where you're at, just make sure you're trending up. And if you don't know, surely you got somebody around you, you can go, man, I wanna get a little more humble, a little more hungry, and a little better relationally in my soft skills, smart. Like ask somebody, make sure that you trend in the right direction. Because in isolation, you always trend in the wrong direction. So you guys, uh, you're investing in this and you're gonna be successful. Oh, I had the last one, <clears throat> favor. Uh, I'll add to Lencioni's deal. The last one I put on there is favor and I do it for this reason. You can be humble, you can be hungry, and you can be smart. I know people like that, where I used to live over in Bashkortostan, Russia, where they had 1,500% inflation, the environment's a mess, and there's no opportunity. We live in this place where we have great favor. We have tremendous opportunity. We have a level playing field, when I lived over there in the 90s, everybody was paying money to the mafia or else they would hurt you. Like extortion was the rule everywhere. Like we don't have that. And so you can have those three things, but ultimately when people say what makes you successful, always go back to this, the favor of God. He favored me because he put me in a place where there's peace. He put me in a place where there's freedom, where there's equality of opportunity. He put me in a place where I was taught how to work as a young man. He put me in a place, gave me a brain that could figure some of this stuff out. He gave me a wife who can intuit stuff that I can't see or feel. Like it's favor at the end of the day. Don't be a, don't be a receiver who gets in the end zone, spikes the ball, thumps your chest and goes, I did that. Because I'm always going like, who made you that fast? <laughs> you didn't make yourself that fast. You was born that fast. And so I hope all you guys have great success. And I hope all of you have great favor. Thanks. All right. Uh, the market the way it is, you will be in my way if you flip flip to <laughs> houses this year. So 
write down what, what you actually want to do, what would make you happy. Um, not everybody, and you can't start out being a wholesaler or a flipper and bur- doing burr houses all in the first year, guys. Write down where you are now, make a little scorecard, and what's your bucket list? What do you want to do this year? What do you want to do next year? I love that. Thanks, Todd. Hey, does anybody have any questions for Todd? Did you, um, you got a second for Q&A? Does anybody have any questions, market-related, realtor? Did you take the thing off? Yeah, what do you think, Mike? The, the hedge funds have been active for a while. Some people probably uh, interacted with them a lot. We, we just noticed that you could always go and pitch your house to a hedge fund, but we noticed that everything we put on now, almost immediately we get an offer of sight unseen from at least one, if not two, hedge funds. And so they're just more active than we've ever seen them. And so, I mean, there's some names out there. I give you some names. So people that want to turn something quick, that's always that's always an opportunity. I don't know if it's your best opportunity. You probably got wholesalers maybe better, but, but it is interesting because our geography here is just so desirable. The other thing I heard, I don't know if this is the case, but it's conjecture at this point, but they were talking about, you know, our housing prices have always been a little depressed based on national averages and some people are saying that that basically what's going on now is there's a reset and even when there's a correction we're never going back down to where we were in comparison to other areas of the country which is why so much that hedge fund money is coming in here because you can buy more for your dollar but but it's a uh, there's a reset it's going to be a new bottom that's the conjecture Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Yeah, some of the hedge funds are just buying. They're just going on artificial intelligence. They they see the house is available. They're gonna they it spits out a number, and they're gonna send that offer in. So this is pretty much though through like the MLS. Like if you list something on the MLS, that's where they're picking yes. them up. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But they'll buy off market too. You just gotta send it to them. And we sold. I think for the first time ever, we put one out competitively in the market on MLS and sold to a hedge fund because they had the best deal, which, you know, usually they're, they're kind of hitting you at wholesale rates. But I'm also just from, I'll, go, I'll tell you from a town council perspective that some guys are coming in trying to build some some rentals because they, they look nationwide at rental rates and they came in and said rental rates in the Lexington area are some of the most premier that they see in kind of the southeast so there's just a lot of outside interest in our area mm-hmm. what you have Zach? by email uh it's uh todd period carnes at todd realty partners.com we can put that in the facebook group too yeah. that's all right anybody else I was yes sir sorry no you're fine i was wondering can you when you say premiere can you define that for us you know, when you say about the premier rents, you know, comparison to yeah. I mean, they, they just they just look at dollars per square foot, almost like they would uh, look at some kind of commercial space. And so, when they look at dollars per square foot, they go, "We we can get more there." Obviously, based on construction costs, and they just do their returns than almost anywhere else because a couple of th- different things just. Part of it is just the housing crunch and affordable housing in our area, especially. It's just unavailable, and there's a lot of industry moving in. So people have to move. I mean, they got to bring their workers in, and so it's just driving those prices. And the schools. So yeah, it's, I mean, some people are. It's kind of a new model. They they brought a new model where they were proposing these modular homes, not mobile homes, but modular homes. I think they were going to build. They're proposing to build 300 of them. And, and they're all rentals. It's basically like a flat apartment complex, uh, but there's separation, you know, and it's not up, it's out, which is an advantage. But those are the guys, and they're building them all around, and they, I think they're putting maybe one in Somerville, uh, but the rents are just that high. Mm-hmm. Anyway. All right. All right. Okay. Thank you, Todd. 
All right, y'all. So I, I venture to think that most of you are here because you got some kind of um, burning desire. You feel like Todd was talking about, like you're a little bit different. You're not that normal nine to five work for 35 years and then you're done, right? Can I, can I get an amen to that? Right. So don't leave here and be excited about it and go home and do nothing about it until next month. Okay. So take that fire, take that burning desire that you're feeling right now and work on it. It might not be buying a house tomorrow, but it might be researching or getting your network, growing your network. You have to start somewhere. Guys, when I started uh, 14 years ago, I made a ton of mistakes, uh, a lot of mistakes, and uh, but it was moving forward and eventually this is where I ended up. All right. So do that. Leave here. Take some action. Get to know somebody before you leave if you haven't already. And we will see you next two weeks at our next REI Live on site. All right. Thank you all for coming. We'll talk to you soon.